Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello, I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Welcome to episode 114. You can find all the links for this episode at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 114. Today we continue our working actor series on the podcast. What is it like to be a working actor? How did a choice of school help? What is it like to tour? What's something you should definitely not do? The focus for this week is back to school. How does theater school help prepare a working actor? Today I talked to actor Steve Ross, who is just finishing up his 11th year of the Stratford Shakespeare Festival, and he started his journey at Canada's National Theatre School. And I just need to preface that when I was recording this podcast, I was suffering from a mild case of consumption, or better known as a cold. I'm sniffling and coughing, all that fun stuff. I apologize greatly. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Steve Ross. Hello, Steve. Hello. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. All right. So first of all, where in the world are you right now? I am in Stratford. I am in my 11th season at the Stratford Festival. Uh, Is that lovely to have a long-term job? Do you look forward to every year? It's fantastic. Yeah. Not only is it nice to have an eight-month gig in general, but it's also just a really fantastic place to work. I have loved it since I got here. I didn't intend to ever get here. No? No, I didn't ever think I would, actually. It was sort of assumed when I went to the National Theatre School. It's kind of a pipeline and people just immediately head to Stratford, but I didn't because I wanted to really look at musicals. It was when I graduated, it was the time of the big, big musicals and multiple musicals running in Toronto, and I wanted to focus on that. So I moved to Toronto right away instead of pursuing Stratford, and I was there for seven years before they called me to come into audition, and I finally did get my head around, yeah, we could do both. You can do musicals and classical stuff here and I have since fallen deeply in love with the place. So Isn't that interesting that I think sometimes actors get into their head that they can only be one kind of actor, do one kind of thing. Yeah. Is that something that you went through when you were a younger actor? Well, I think I imposed it on myself weirdly. There I was at a really wonderful classical school that was giving you wonderful classical training and all I wanted was to do musicals and I I guess I was too narrow-minded. That's all I wanted to do. And I actually almost quit NTS. Wow. Because I thought, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I should focus more on musical theater. And as I was on my way to quit, our singing teacher at NTS walked by me in the hall. And he was a great guy. And he said, oh, where are you going? I said, I think I'm going to quit and go to Sheridan for musical theater. And completely innocently, he went, oh, that's weird. You don't have that good a voice. (laughs) And it wasn't said meanly, it was just said as a comment, and I literally turned around and went back to class. So, and I'm sure one would hope that others would have tried to talk me out of quitting as well, but it it sort of didn't get that far. I sort of went, oh, I guess I'll stay then. (laughs) It's amazing how one comment can just sort of turn everything around. Completely changed, yeah. And I told him that story years later, and he laughed, and, and of course didn't remember saying it, and laughed and laughed. But yeah, I'm so happy with the training that I got from that place. And then I just sort of played catch up when I got to Toronto after I graduated with the musical theater stuff. So it sort of was an ongoing process for me. Yeah, well, let's talk about National Theatre School. A lot of um, the folks who listen to this podcast have students who are looking at going on and, and becoming and going into some training and going into programs past high school. So let's start with when you were in high school, why did you pursue National Theater School? For those of us and also for those listening who are American, National Theater School is sort of Canada's national. <laughs> it is what it is, right? It's a National Theater School. It is, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing else to say about it. So what made you decide to go there? Well, it was a bit of a longer process for me. I didn't really act in high school. Again, was told I couldn't sing in high school. (laughs) Isn't that funny? And I really don't think I could in high school. I didn't have any sort of an ear and I was really pitchy. And so I was in band and all sorts of stuff like that. And so I didn't do, I think I did one play in high school and I liked it. 
But it didn't really occur to me that it was a career. So I went into sports medicine and I was at the University of Western in London for a year. And it wasn't really specific enough, the course, and I wanted to do something even more specific. So I, I got accepted to another school that I was going to go to and then just sort of decided not to and just sort of decided to take a year off. And I fell into a summer acting course, which was really fantastic. And then uh, so I got the bug a bit there, but I just still wasn't positive if I was going to do it for real. So I went to a university that my father worked at and I could go for free. But I didn't want to spend any more money or any more of his hard earned money until I knew what I wanted to do. So I went for a year at this university for the in their theater program. And it was a great program. But again, a university program, I find, is very different than a conservatory program in that there's all sorts of other things that go towards getting a degree. And I absolutely understand the value of that. But it still wasn't exactly what I was looking for. So I asked around and the National Theatre School was suggested to me. And I didn't realize that 700 people apply every year and 10 <laughs> people could accept, which was great. Ignorance is bliss. Absolutely. And I didn't get in the first year, but they asked me to come back the second year, the, the next year. So I went back for a second year at this university and then auditioned and, and finally got in. And so it ended up being a year at Western, two years at the, this other university, and then uh, yet another three years at, at the National Theatre School. So by the time you got there, you were ready to take on this career, kind of. Yeah, I think I knew at that point. And interestingly, everyone in my class, except for one, had done the same thing. Huh. Every single one of us had been to some sort of post-secondary. There was one guy right out of high school, but all the rest of us had been around for a bit. And I think it was really, they're very good at NTS at figuring out a dynamic for a class. And we all sort of came with the real fire of, yep, we've been around for a bit. We do know what we want now. And I think it really made for a good class dynamic. Well, it also makes for you really take things seriously. You know? I agree. I agree. And you have to at that school. Well, you can faff around as much as you want, but you'll really not be taking advantage of the 12 hours a day that they offer you at NTS. So yeah, it was good that we were all ready. One acting teacher who came in for a, a six-week course with us called us the basketball team all the time because she said... <laughs> She said, you guys, you guys don't seem to do anything socially, but when you get in the class, all you want to do is compete with each other and, and be better than each other. And I thought it was a really good way to describe us because we really, really, all we ever wanted to do was get on stage and play. We weren't really interested in going for drinks and knowing how everyone was. We, I mean, it's not like we hated each other, but we really, we really just wanted to be better and, and play the game better with each other. So I, I always loved that dynamic. You've used the school for what it's for, to learn and to prepare yourself. Yeah, everybody was there to, to learn and to really take advantage of it. I was always amazed because you would watch the dynamics of the other years as you were there, and they had a very different but really clear dynamic in their classes too. And I was always amazed at how, as an audition panel, you would find people with that same dynamic. It was, it was very interesting to me, yeah. What was the most valuable thing about going to a theater school? I loved how much stuff they throw at you in that theater school. I mean, getting there at 10 in the morning and leaving at 8 at night, you would do the core stuff, the voice and the movement and all that sort of stuff every morning and the singing and the, the improv stuff. And then in the afternoon, there would be six week blocks and you would do everything under the sun. You would do scene study or you would do contact improv or you would do stage combat. And, you know, there would be people coming up from New York or people coming up from Toronto. The great thing was it was always working artists who would come in as guest teachers. And that's what I loved is that you had a wonderful core of teachers who were there. And you also had people coming in from the business who are working and they were as interested in talking to you about how the business works and function at being a functioning person in that business when you graduate as they were with the project we were working on. So it was I've always appreciated that. I've talked to other actors, and one thing that, that they talk about sometimes is about how their schooling didn't prepare them for the real world, and about how if you're talking to working actors, you get a sense of what it means to take on that mantle, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I've been asked that question before, whether I felt prepared when I got out. And I, I had friends while I was in first year, they were in first year in a Toronto school, and so we would go through our programs at the same time, and we would compare notes kind of thing. and. When they were in their third year, in their final year, and they were doing their performance year, 
they were very aware of what agent was coming to the show and what person and what thing like that. And we weren't in Montreal. We were in this kind of beautiful cocoon, which I guess didn't help with the business side of it. But what it did do was I felt like we got five true performances. We did five shows in my third year and it was never about the critics. It was never about, oh my God, there's an agent coming. Please, I have to get representation. We sort of were blissfully allowed to just do the shows and wildly succeed or wildly fail. We, we, we did a show that was so bad, but it was a real learning experience too. And then it did mean you had to play a bit of catch up with when you came to Toronto and you had to get used to, okay, this is how an audition call works and this is how a, an agency call works. But I've, I've never, I don't know. I don't know if enough about other theater schools and I don't know whether even NTS does this now. I think they do, but I, I've always wondered if there's a way to start to prepare people for literally the business side, how to write a cover letter, what kind of a headshot you should have, audition etiquette, that kind of stuff. I've always thought that that would be really valuable. Yeah, it's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? Because it's really necessary to have that kind of experience that you had where you just, it's pure performance and also pure failure about, that you that you not worry about what an agent is going to come and see you and see you do something poorly. Yeah. But then on the other side, if you're going to be a working actor, you do need to know the basics. And the basics are, yeah, how to audition. Yeah, you really need that skill set and that toolbox I have a feeling that NTS started to bring an agent in and do sort of a weekend workshop. And I don't know that it would need much more than about a week. Or even if these guest artists were there, if the director of the schools or whatever intentionally said, hey, while you're there, do alert people to how this is going to work and stuff. Because I just feel like it's even if you put it in a class context, I don't know that that would be as worthwhile as just sort of sitting around and going, okay, well, this is what works for me. And this is what didn't work for me. And that's why I think it's so valuable too, when they will bring back guest actors. I went back one time to NTS about four years after I'd graduated and did a show with them. You know, I know Soul Pepper, I think Soul Pepper in Toronto has a, an affiliation with one of the theater schools there. And so you actually get to do a show with working actors. And not only do you learn about, you know, the resumes and all that, the agents and that kind of stuff, you also just learn how to conduct yourself in rehearsals and that kind of thing, which is invaluable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the integration part of it, I think, is so valuable. And regardless of whether that's there or not, you learn pretty quickly or you simply don't progress. So what are the things that you think that you caught on to quite quickly when you, uh, when you moved to Toronto and you started your professional career? What did you see you needed to know? It was interesting, the transition from high school to university in that no one molly coddles you in, in post-secondary. No one cares if you show up for class. No one cares if you fail a class the way that people were always on you in high school. So that was an interesting dynamic. And similarly, you have to be so self-motivated because you literally are self-employed. You are selling your own product. And I had to learn very quickly that if you weren't constantly keeping an eye out for yourself, and looking for jobs and looking for the next gig and looking for the next wet class to improve yourself and stuff. No one else was going to do it for you. I found that something that you very quickly had to get on that train or, or again, you just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And it's hard enough to get work right out of theater school anyway, that if you don't start to be proactive right away, I think you just don't get into that rhythm. And I feel lucky that I came very quickly to really like the business side of things. Oh, yeah. In what way? I really dug the chase of things. It made me feel really empowered. And I still, to this day, I love the period from about March of the calendar year to about May when all the theaters all around the country announce their seasons. And it's like just I get to pick and choose and I get to say, hey, this theater, I'd like to play this role. What do you think about that for me? It's not like every one of them goes, yes, please, Steve, come and work. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? But at least it's a period where I am completely in control of a career that you don't have a ton of control over in a lot of aspects. And I've always felt really empowered in that. So I, I love that sec that time when you go, oh, that's a show I'd love to do. I'll write to him or I'll write to her. And so, yeah, I really dig that that kind of a thing. That's a great attitude to have because it is a career that does have so little control and it's so easy to get overwhelmed by rejection, isn't it? It really is. It really is. That's a really good point. I just did a talk back after a show the other night 
And a woman said, well, my daughter is going into the theater. And uh, statistically, it's very difficult. This, I said, listen, I, we are not pretending that it's a difficult profession, but it's a fantastic profession. And why would I ever quell someone's want to be in that profession? But you do have to very quickly come to terms with the fact that, yes, you are going to get rejected a lot. I feel very lucky also that one of my first Joe jobs, quote unquote, was as a receptionist at a theater company in Toronto. And I also got to be the assistant to the casting director, kind of his gopher while we were there. So I got to be in a lot of auditions where I was on the other side of the table very early on. And I learned very quickly that rejection isn't always doesn't always mean that you are the failure. There are so many factors in what goes into casting someone that it kind of took a lot of pressure off. So I felt lucky that very quickly I went, oh, okay, I can keep going. Because I know I've watched friends leave the business because they just went, I can't do it anymore. I can't be said no to one more time. And you think, no, 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 it's not always your talent. It's There are so many factors to getting cast in a show that I felt lucky that I could watch that process at an early time in my career. Well, and it just must have made you see a lot of mistakes too that uh, happen at auditions. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what are some of the big ones? Apologizing for your work. Oh. I've been a reader a lot for auditions. So, you know, I'm the one who sits there and comes in and reads the scene with the actors. It is so fascinating, the number of people who the first thing out of their mouth is, yeah, I'm not feeling well today. Or, yeah, I just got these yesterday. I just got these uh, this scene yesterday. And you think, well, nobody's interested in that. So if you're sick, and, and if you are genuinely sick, sure, they're going to know you're sick. No one's kidding themselves in the room. But to apologize for the work or to say, I didn't get this till yesterday. Well, probably no one got this till yesterday. So suck it up, buttercup. I found it fascinating that the people that would immediately cut themselves off at the knees and apologize for their work. And I realized that if you just dive in, that's the best way to do. And then hopefully, if the director wants to see you again, and if you're right for it, they will just go, great. So that was good. Um, let's try it this way. <laughs> you know, onward you'd go. But yeah, it's amazing to me, the number of people or the number of people who really won't be open to the director's changes in an audition. It's always interesting to me that people will come in with a very clear idea of what they want to do. And then the director will go, yeah, great. Can you just try it like this? And they'll do it exactly the same way as they did the first time. That's a big problem with very young actors, with high school actors. Do you? Yes. That concept just doesn't resonate with them, that it's okay, Well, and it's all about failure. It's all that notion of failure, where in, in school, they're told that if they fail at something, that they get a bad mark. And to change is equal to failure in some of their minds. I know. It's so hard, eh? We have students a lot at chats, and the first thing they say often is, what would you do differently if you went back to theater school? And my answer is always, I would be more fearless because I spent, and, and, and at NTS, you are blessed with, there are no marks at NTS. You have an interview at the end of every term and you either get asked to leave or you get asked to stay. And you have a pretty good idea if you're going to be asked to leave anyway. It's not like it just comes out of nowhere, but you don't have the marks thing. But I still wish that I had been more fearless. I wish I'd taken more chances. I spent so much time trying to, to do what I thought the teachers wanted. And they even told me that. They told me that at one of my interviews. They said, yeah, yeah, it's really good. That it's all there. You just got to have more fun. And I really, and the penny didn't really drop. I mean, I still feel like I learned a lot at that school, but I, I wish I'd been more fearless. So now, after years of, of being in the profession, do you feel that you have carried with you from your experience at NTS? What still has stayed with you from being at a theater school? If anything. <laughs> no, there's a lot. I think a lot about stuff. I think about specifics. I think about what different teachers say. We had a clown teacher from Toronto. I really, really liked that six weeks. And she taught us the concept of stillness in auditions and stillness in rehearsal and how valuable less is more and those kind of things. And those are concepts that are really hard as a student, I find, to really, really embrace and trust. But as you go on, it all gets in by osmosis and it's all in the hard drive swimming around, but it never really clarifies itself until it needs to which is weird. I don't know if that makes sense, but I constantly think about people. I think about one of our acting teachers from the first year who was in from the HB studios in New York, who said some of the best things, but boy, did they not make sense to me when I was in the class. 
but then the penny will drop in a very specific situation and you go, oh, that's what they meant. Oh, well, then, then I'll try that now. And now there's no worry about, oh, my God, what does the teacher think? You can just do it. So just a couple of weeks ago, I was because these are long runs here at Stratford. And I was thinking, yeah, how do I freshen this scene up? And one of my acting teachers popped in. He used to say I had to come on laughing in a scene. And he used to say, it's not working. You don't need really dirty jokes. I said, I know. I know a couple. He said, tell yourself one of your really dirtiest jokes before you come on. And I did it in the show the other day. And it really freshened the scene up for me. So I guess you need to be open enough to receive all of the information, even if you're not going to use it immediately so that it's kicking around in your hard drive. But I appreciate that they did tell us that, too. They said, we're throwing a lot of stuff at you guys and we don't expect you to process it all. We just want you to experience it all. So I guess that's the value that they let us experience a ton of different stuff. And then it was up to us to go, yeah, that worked for me or no, that was really not helpful for me. But that's OK that it wasn't helpful. No experience goes completely wasted. No, no. And I think that's important to have that sort of file cabinet eh, where things just kind of go in and then you pull it out. That must be very useful for you when you have to do these long runs. As you just said, you want to freshen a scene, you, you pull out something that you learned in the past. Yeah. As we wrap up here, just I think that would be really useful for our listeners just to talk a bit about what it's like to be in a really long run. Because Stratford, you guys run from April to October, something like that. We do, yeah. What's it like to play the same character for months at a time? Well, again, it's special here. I love it because we do two or three shows, so it's rep. So for one thing, you're never doing more than four a week, which is fantastic. It keeps it that much fresher. I have learned over the years being here that because it's a long run, that the more I can dig in in rehearsals and really find stuff that works for me and stuff that resonates for me, that will only help me long term because I've done enough shows that get rehearsed in, gosh, I once had to do Two a show. Weeks. From, well, <laughs> one I week? Did nine days one time. Oh, my gosh. Nine days from first rehearsal to first preview. And I was playing triplets in it. Boy, was it a hard show. It was a fantastic experience. But you sometimes rehearse things so fast that you realize about three weeks into the run, oh, yeah, we never really dug into this moment. And now I have no idea what it is. And then it's gone. What this place has taught me and what the, long, the other long runs that I've done in Toronto have taught me is the more I can dig in in rehearsal and make real, real sense of stuff, the more I can continue to come back to that and be able to go, yeah, no, this is what we did in rehearsal and this is what this moment was. Now, how can we shift that slightly if we need to? But at least there's a cornerstone. Occasionally I find, and it's my fault, that I didn't do enough homework in rehearsals and I didn't dig in enough. And so the moments didn't make sense. And then I was sort of left adrift by myself second and third week into the run. So yeah, I think for me, the more I key in in rehearsals, the more I can do the long run. And then there's the logistic thing of folks now in September paid exactly the same amount of money and are coming to see the show that I opened back in May. And it's really important to remember that it doesn't matter if you're having a lousy day or something. This is their one chance and they spend a lot of money to come to this and you get to go out there and play and there's, come on, there's, is there a better job? We could be digging ditches. We could be coal mining. I always go back to that. I am not coal mining. <laughs> exactly. I'm putting clothes on and I'm being a jerk for two hours. And <laughs> Come on. There's really worse things. That gets me into gear too. And I also continually try to get better at just listening to the other person on stage. And I find that that is absolutely everything for a long run. If the other person is in the same boat and they just want to listen to you and you just listen to them, it just takes you back into the story of it as opposed to thinking, oh my God, this is the 60th show or what am I going to make for dinner? I have a show tonight and all that kind of stuff. Well, it becomes, but then it becomes two people in a conversation as opposed to here's my line, now it's your line, yeah, now it's exactly. someone else's line. Yeah, you're just marking time as opposed to just really getting out there and doing it. And lastly, what's one piece of advice would you give to a young high school student? They're like, they've got the stars in their eyes. They're like, I want to be an actor. This is what I want more than anything else. What's the piece of advice that you would give them as they think about that career? I would firstly make sure you know why you want to be an actor. Uh, a couple of people, when I was in, in the university theater school course, we went around in a circle and they said, why do you want to be an actor? And two of them said, I want to be a star. Mm. I thought, ooh, that's not a... So really, I would think, really, really think about whether you like acting or whether you like the business of it. 
and know that it's tough. It's not a walk in the park. And, and I mean, it's easy to say when I get to work at Stratford that, oh, no, really, really think about what you're doing. But I, I feel like as if you really, really want to do it and you have loved the process and the meat and potatoes bones of the acting when, what that you've done in high school, then go for it. But know that if it's just something you see on TV and you think, I want to be that star, that's fantastic too. I mean, I guess why not swing for the fences? It just, I've always just loved putting on other people's skins and getting into their heads and doing those roles. And that's why I like doing it. But it's a lot of work and it's a lot of dedication. And there's easier jobs, I guess. <laughs> it's the bottom line. And if you're not ready for the work that it entails, maybe think about something else. But I never want to dissuade people at the same time. I hate when I hear people say, oh, no, don't, don't do it just because it's hard. I think, well, everything's hard. Every, to do everything well is hard. Yeah. To be a craftsperson and make a chair is hard, but to make a good chair, that's a beautiful accomplishment. But yeah, I guess if you're prepared to do it, then go for it, I guess, would be the advice. Mm, that doesn't sound like great advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure, Lynn. Thank you so much, Steve. So Steve and Craig worked together on a show a number of years ago, and the general consensus is that there is not a nicer or more generous person and actor than Steve Ross. And I am thrilled and honored that he made time for us today. It's great. So if you want in on the written reflection and listening quiz for your students for this Working Actor series, make sure you join our email list. You can get the link in the show notes for this episode, theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 114. Before we go, let's do some theater folk news. It's a play feature, it's a play feature, it's time to feature a play, and I'm going old school on this one. We go back to the beginning of theater folk. Among Friends and Clutter is one of my very first plays. I didn't have a lot of experience writing plays. I didn't even have a lot of experience acting in plays, but this one came from the heart, and I think that's what shows. Mostly because this play is over 20 years old, and it still gets done to this day, which it really blows my mind, actually. It just, it amazes me. So this play is divided into three sections, friends, family, and love. And it looks at the different relationships in all of those areas. The characters start out as children, they grow, they succeed, and sometimes they fail, and they fail big time. There's a lot of clutter in our lives and in the lives of these characters. So here's a monologue for one of the characters, Joanne, from the family section. And she is sitting with her comatose father in the garden. <sighs> there we are. Don't want to catch a cold. But I don't think you'll have to worry today. The sun is so warm. Not hot, just warm. A perfect day. The tulips look great, Dad. The colors are so beautiful. Mom said you planted them last She thought the frost might have damaged them, but they look fine. Mom looks tired. More tired than usual. I came as quick as I could. I went for a walk this morning down by the river. Everything has changed so much. Would you believe it? I ran into a girl I went to high school with. She's never left town. Helen, mm, funny, I can't remember her last name. Anyway, she had the most beautiful child, a baby boy with red cheeks and the curliest blonde hair you have ever seen. The house looks a little sad. I think I'm going to go down to the paint store and pick up something for the shutters. You always said that good-looking shutters can hide a thousand flaws. Mom told me you've been like this for a while now. Although she swears you said her name last week. Your face is warm. Are you feeling the sun somewhere in there? Are you in there somewhere? Can you see me? This afternoon, we'll go to the park and we'll watch the kids play on the swings, as long as it doesn't rain. Would you like that? Would you like to go to the park? Please say something. Daddy? Anything? Please. That's Among Friends and Clutter. Go to the show notes, theaterfolk.com, episode 114, and read more sample pages from Among Friends and Clutter. Do it. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? Where can you direct students to find this podcast? We post new episodes every Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk. 
And you can find us on the Stitcher app. And you can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theater folk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.